The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advice professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where your clients have the best wealth technology at their fingers. With NetWealth's next-gen client portal and mobile app, clients can view and manage their portfolio, assets, and accounts wherever they are. By adding external bank and property feeds to their NetWealth account, they can get a true picture of their wealth. And by giving them the ability to transact and manage their cash, they can feel in control of their wealth. A world of client engagement awaits. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today, we're talking Aussie AI note-taking and transcription with James Wartho, CEO at Fintalker, which is specifically designed for Australian financial planning businesses to create accurate and structured file notes as well as help with the next steps. So James has extensive financial services experience and has been involved in solving incredibly complex problems at an international level. So the way that they've built and approached Fintalker answers basically every question any licensee would have when it comes to considering rolling something like this out, from functionality requirements to security and data sovereignty, and the view that AI note-taking platforms should be helping us comply. What Fintalker does is enable you to scale safely and seamlessly helping more clients or at the very least increasing productivity or creating efficiencies. I started by asking James what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. Oh, well, I think it's probably some of my uh, older mobile phone models right. that were close to me um, and I just can't bring myself to throw them away. Uh, and I think somewhere I've even got an iPhone through somewhere. Oh, but, nice. uh, it's probably getting uh, to the point where I probably need to do something with it. I think the batteries get unstable after a long time. So we probably need to do something about it at some point. Yeah, I think there's a definite element of maybe um, obviously wear and tear, but Apple and sort of planned obsolescence in terms of battery. But it's, I think it's becoming quite trendy to, you know, the resurgence of the dumb phone. I think Nokia, for example, have just re-released something from the early 2000s, which I find really interesting. And then, yeah, well, my next... Well, yeah. actually, you've just reminded me, I, ha- I have got one of those old Nokia uh, yeah, okay. bones that used to last, the battery used to last for five days and they were bulletproof and it worked up until a couple of years ago. So that, that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I think, yeah, just that anxiety of my of battery running low at sort of 10 a.m. And, and need to find a charger. So in terms of AI, I know it's a massive part of what makes up FinTalker as a product, but there may be one or two ways you're using that you're using AI either in your sort of personal or business life. Yeah, sure. Um, so actually, we do a lot, of, as, as you can imagine, we do a lot of software development and um, AI has helped progress and speed software development markedly in the last couple yeah. of years. I'll give you an example. OpenAI uh, has ingested the whole of GitLab, uh, GitHub, which is the global repository for open source software. And so GitHub, uh, you used to have to kind of search for an example set of code that you might want to look at or read or understand. But now you can just ask OpenAI to write you a piece of code and it will access all of that um, GitHub knowledge in order to help you write a piece of code. So for our developers, it's really been a boom in terms of um, helping them with productivity on that front. Yeah, amazing. No, I think, yeah, just the the speed of development there. And I know that... um, it's probably quickly becoming a tool that they couldn't live without. So I'm totally with you there. Now, I'm excited for today's discussion on on FinTalker. Do you mind actually sort of going back and, and starting with your origin story, James, and then how FinTalker came to be? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, goes back uh, 
a, f- a fair way, Patrick, actually. So I, I actually left school at 16. I grew up in the eastern suburbs, uh, Maroubra, so not one of the most prestigious eastern suburbs back in the day, but but the eastern suburbs, close to the beach, I went to Maroubra Bay High School. And I, I left school at 16, so I was actually an early leaver. Uh, I got an apprenticeship uh, with ICI at the time, and I was an instrument and control fitter at ICI. Uh, and so what that meant was they, they had all these big uh, refineries and petrochemical plants. And if you can think about tens of thousands of instruments measuring everything that's going wrong on the chemical plant, and then control systems that were processing all of that data in, in real time, and and then making decisions about uh, what to do on the chemical plant. Do you open a valve? Do you shut a valve? Do you heat something up? Do you cool it down? And think about that happening on mass scale in real time. And my job as a 16-year-old, well, as a 16-year-old, it was to carry the toolbox for the tradesmen, but my job when I got qualified was to help care and tune and, and, and make those systems work. Um, so th- that's where I started, quite a technical uh, technical background. And then I went back to U- uni. I, w- I had to go back and do my uh, high school at, at TAFE in the evening. So I went back and did that. And then I did an engineering degree. And so I did a lot of computing and electrical engineering and control as part of a uni degree. And I went back to the chemical plant, working on designing a lot of these big systems that were ingesting all of this data. So I did that for the first 12 years of my career. And then I thought, well, the, the big industries uh, that are really exploding at the moment are either telcos or IT. And I had a whole lot of knowledge that was relevant to both. So I, I ended up going into um, IT and I worked for one of the big consulting companies and they put me straight into financial services. And I was kind of in my mid, now uh, probably 26, 27, I went straight into financial services. Uh, so, so straight out of manufacturing and straight into financial services. And uh, and and I ended up working uh, in London and uh, as part of the dot-com boom. And, and after a few years, I ended up, you know, two or three, I ended up in London working for big investment bank clients in the dot-com boom, building and, and leading the build of their um, digital trading platforms. Back in the day when, Everything was new. It was it was the, the digital economy and the e-commerce world was still new. There were very few components that you could lift and build. You had to build everything from scratch. And we were building, you know, we were building the cross-border equity trading platforms yeah, so. and fixed income and foreign currency trading platforms uh, that were multilingual and multi-bank and multi-exchange. And you know, and I'm talking in. The year 1999, 2000, 2001. So uh, uh, if you think about it, again, it, a lot of data, a lot of real-time data going on in all of these financial markets globally, but being able to ingest them, make sense of them, and and then take actions that were really critical. What do you, what do you want to do with the, out, the output of the analysis of all of this data in real time? How do you make decisions? And, and so that progressed into building things like automat- automated hedging algorithms for one of the big banks based out of London. So we built one using um, uh, that was for euro dollar trading, so the biggest traded currency in the world at the time, for the biggest euro dollar trading bank in the world. And we built a hedge, uh, hedging automatic position calculation, risk management system, and hedging for this bank and put it live. And the funny thing is, is that I took some of the knowledge from industrial control that I had and brought that into the world of financial markets and applied it there. And so we ended up with this system that was trading 24 hours a day, trading the bank's euro dollar position. So, but again, lots of data, real time getting pulled into a system. So I did that for mm, 10 years. I came back to Australia in 2010 went into Macquarie Bank and uh, headed up technology for some of their big trading divisions globally, doing the similar things for Macquarie Bank here in Australia, but with a global remit. And so that was um, a lot of fun. Uh, enjoyed that work with some great people. And then the in that space, the um, we were hit by the regulatory tsunami following the GFC, 
So in 2011-12, Dodd-Frank, there were huge reforms of all over-the-counter trading and all exchange-traded products went under a huge reform process uh, and huge regulatory burden. And at that point, what we needed to do as a bank for Macquarie was we needed to look at every single position that Macquarie was taking in real time and we had to uh, we had to bring that position or trade or transaction in, convert it into a way that one of our eighty three global regulators would understand wow. a format that one of those regulators would understand, and then we had to uh, process that and report it to the regulators in near real time. So the US regulator had a fifteen minute window. So it was it was a huge challenge, and and so my job uh, at the bank at that point became uh, really taking all of the data that they needed to report to over 83 regulators in the world, and this is across Macquarie Bank globally, and and run all the teams and all the technology and design all of that to make that happen. So each challenge, I've got a few grey hairs from it, but, um, but again, you think about it, it's about absorbing huge amounts of data, processing it, making sense of it in real time, finding insights into it, and then putting that to really good use for the organisation. So you asked me about uh, how all this led to FinTalker. So we've talked about these huge data sets, and I want to talk briefly now about voice, voice data. Think about the most challenging set of unstructured data on the planet, and it is voice. There are conversations going on. Now, how do you capture those conversations? How do you ingest them? How do you make sense of them? How do you you use technology to drive out insights that can help whatever industry you're working in? And how do you do that at scale? And how do you do it in real time? How do you do it as people are speaking? And so that's how FinTalker came about. We wanted to tackle that next great challenge of data. And so we set about building a platform that can ingest voice data and, of course, any other data. If you can ingest voice data, you can do pretty much anything else. Uh, How can you ingest all of that data and voice data at scale and in real time and use that to drive out insights, productivity, assist with compliance, assist with decision-making and put all that in place to help an industry? And that's why we wanted to tackle the challenge of FinTalker and that's why we've built FinTalker. Far out. No, it's um, that's an incredible origin story, James. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that you've clearly, you've clearly solved or been part of solving some really complex problems that make something like this look relatively simple, like as I say, relatively, but also just thinking about, you know, 80 plus regulators with certain time windows and, you know, we find it challenging to deal with, you know, less than sort of 10 product providers and forms and all that sort of thing. So that's really, it's really sort of sobering to think that what is possible. Um, so when we sort of think about FinTalker, like you've taken us through um, sort of the early stages of, of why you thought that was a solution worth building or developing. Why why FinTalker when there's, you know, sort of current out-of-the-box solutions? Like do they fall down in very obvious areas or what's the – What's been the approach there versus those other tools that are on the market that are very, very sort of general based in terms of AI note taking and transcription? Yeah, so so a good question, and there, and there has been a little bit of um, you know a surge in general note taking applications in the last couple of years, and and a lot of those are based on you know the evolution of large language models. Um, yeah, I th- I think there's definitely a place for general AI biz tech in every industry. So you should be able to have a conversation and 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 then you should be able to get a nice paragraph or a couple of paragraphs of summary out of that. And um and, and that's useful, you know, for uh, you know parent teacher meetings, it's useful for uh, you know charity meetings, it's useful, you know, it's general biz tech that applies in you know, it does some good general things in in in, and does something for every industry. But but um, for for industries like financial advice, uh, where there is you know a very deep set of domain knowledge and requirements to operate the business, our view is that you need uh, specific 
advice tech to help you do that. Um, and I'll, I'll give you, you know, my take on the industry. Um, yeah, financial advice in Australia currently, it's, a, it's an industry that really is in crisis. There's, there's no other word to use for it. It's in crisis. Um, there are not enough advisors. There are very steep compliance requirements. Every single CEO or, or a chief operating officer or, or executive officer of every advice firm, from one person firms to 400, 500 person licensees, they are incredibly challenged by how to make their business productive. How do they get productivity up? And after the Royal Commission, the industry was so heavily regulated that that in order to satisfy those regulatory requirements, you've got advisors and their support staff really doing a whole lot of compliance work and documentation work, which is required to to provide a defendable position for the bank or for the for the advice firms should something go wrong. Now, um, uh, where does that lead us to? Well, in Australia, the average advisor sees about 120 clients or has about yeah. 120 clients in their in their in their client list. Now, you compare that internationally. The, the UK has uh, UK advisors see more like 240, so they're yeah, seeing well. double the number of clients. Now, you know, some of that is you know some of that's rig setting, some of it's uh, uh, technology investment. Um, but in the end, what this means is that advisors can't see that many clients, and 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 what that means is that only ten or twelve percent of Australians are getting financial advice. Now, if you think about Australia having an aging population, you know that, that's a disaster. You know the number following the Royal Commission, the number of Australians getting financial advice has dropped significantly, nearly halved by some estimates. Certainly, the number of advisors has nearly halved in the last five or six years. So, so we've got this challenge as a country. You know, how do we keep the, the the regulatory requirements and the compliance level high enough that it gives protection, adequate protection to consumers? How do we empower advisors to be more productive and increase their productivity while satisfying those compliance requirements? How do we allow advisors to to dramatically increase the number of clients that they can service? That will bring the cost of advice down a bit, but it will also expand the revenue source for advisors. Um, how do you do that and get that sort of change? Well, in my view and our view at, at uh, Shintalker is that AI and, and advice tech in particular, very specific, deep domain-tuned AI and, and platforms can help get that sort of major uplift. Now, you talked a bit, Patrick, about um, generic... Uh, biz tech AI, so this can help, and, and, and will get you some sort of productivity lift. Maybe if you're seeing, I don't know, sixty clients in a year, it'll get you to eighty. Maybe it'll get you to eighty-five. But is it going to get you from one hundred and twenty to two hundred and forty? Uh, unlikely. Um, and and the reasons are pretty simple. You you need when you think about the advice process, you need to we need to make this process. Flows seamless. We need to make the data flow seamless. Um, you know, an example. You know, why can't you log? Why, why can't your clients that are in X plan or mm. whatever is your CRM system automatically be in your advice in your your transcription tool? They should be there, and you should be able to select them. And your transcription tool should understand who's talking, and it should know that you know Bert and Betty are married, and it should know that which one's talking and which one works, and all that sort of stuff. When you finish the call, your notes, file notes should automatically go into x -Plan. They should be there sitting for you when next time you go or midwinter or Pluto or where, wherever you are. Um, but why shouldn't your AI platforms be helping you comply your meetings? Why shouldn't it be saying, this advisor has just done a great job on all of these compliance requirements and everything's ticked off and, and, and really any spot check will we'll show that, that the system registered all of that out of the box and the advisor didn't have to do anything. Um, why can't um, the advisor record the shape of the advice into the file note and actually form up the advice that they want to give after the meeting with a push with one push of the button? And why can't that flow into X plan or wherever it needs to go? 
why can't that be used automatically to start to generate parts of the SOA? Mm. So these are all of the sorts of things. And why can't the power planner automatically get a work package that says, gee, here's the, uh, the meeting details, the audio, the transcript, the detailed file notes, the advice shape, all in a work package ready, the advice shape all in a work package ready to start work producing that advice document, however, however it's going to look. Why can't the client automatically, with with the advisors, um, once the advisors check them, of course, mm. but get get a list of all of the actions and all of the things that they need to do out of the meeting? Why does the advisor need to sit and write that up three days later? Oh, the, these are just some of the examples of how seamless this process could be if you really start thinking about it right out of the box about how you can do it and how you can make it seamless. And with that sort of... Uh, data processing and straight through processing and that sort of focus on really making this process efficient, that's where we're going to get advisors able to see up from 120 clients to 240 and and that and beyond and beyond. And yeah. that's where I think we need to go. And I think that's why we talk uh, over some of these uh, more generic biz tech solutions. No, I love it. it. What you're alluding to is well, directly is the, not only the ability to scale – or scale more than a general tool, but the ability to scale both safely and seamlessly. Like it is as simple as that. And I really love the the thought process there and the thinking around turning that tool, so FinTalk, into like a proactive piece of software rather than, you know, the general tool where it's like, okay, we've done the transcript, here's your AI generator summary, back over to you uh, for the, as you mentioned, the three days later, putting that unstructured information into a, you know, a job form or an advice request, like it's really not only enhancing the the meeting process, but everything that happens afterwards, which I think is, yeah, just unheard of and, and really incredible. You've got a really easy to follow timeline on your website, but do you mind sort of just taking us through how it actually works? So maybe take us through like a face-to-face meeting. So I've just walked in, I've sat down with these clients. How do I then use FinTalker in that meeting? from the meeting perspective, and then how do I use it after the fact as well? Yeah, well, look, um, uh, in-person meetings are, uh, are interesting because a, a lot of the generic AI tools don't actually uh, mm. support in-person meetings, which is which is interesting. Some, some do, uh, but lots do not. But in our experience, at least half of the meetings are in-person uh, in Australia, or even, even today, and it, and it varies from practice to practice. Some are, some are Lots of per- in-person meetings, and some are, some are more majority um, online meetings. But on the whole, about fifty-fifty. So, look for an in-person meeting. Uh, the first thing you need to do is is somehow capture the meeting. Now, there are different ways to do this. Um, one way um, is you can log into FinTalk on your laptop and just put it on a desk, and um, uh, and that will record the meeting for you in real time. Another way is you can upload the audio afterwards. So you may uh, decide to record it on your iPhone. You can use voice memos on your iPhone and then you can just drop the audio file into FinTalker at the end of the meeting or at the end of the week or a couple of days later or or whenever you want to. Now, um, you heard it here first, Patrick, but we have a mobile app coming which is going to run in Android and iOS so you'll get it out of the app store. And That'll be coming uh, in the next one to two months. And um, all you'll do is walk in with your mobile phone into any meeting situation and with one button, push a button on your iPhone and that will automatically capture the meeting. And when you're back in um, mobile coverage, because the meeting could be outside of mobile uh, coverage, yeah, right? Of course. Yeah. So in that case, it, it will record and encrypt on your phone. And as soon as you get a mobile connection, it will up, upload it to Fintalk servers and it will um, then automatically generate all of those things that we were talking about, your file mode and all the compliance checks and all of those sorts of things. So uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, you, you, As long as you've got a recording uh, going, be it on your phone or on your laptop, the platform uh, will do everything else for you. So it will record the meeting, it'll record the audio, it, it will upload automatically, seamlessly. You don't have to do anything to do that. And really, when you finish 
at your meeting and you go and look, and it could be as little as a, a minute or two later, the file note will be there for you and, and drafted up for you and all of your compliance events will be there ticked off for you. So it really is very simple to use. And so that's a, uh, an in-person meeting. Um, if you, if you uh, are doing a Teams meeting, then um, uh, that's very simple. All you do is um, copy the Teams link into um, uh, FinTalker, a Teams um, uh, scribe will join your meeting and then you just carry on with the meeting. As soon as you finish the Teams meeting, you hang up and, um, and again, FinTalker takes care of everything from there for, for you. So it's already got all the audio. We're just commissioning the video as well. So you're going to have all of the slides and the, uh, anything that's shown on screen within FinTalker as well. And, um, and so then, you know, you're going to have to you get the audio got the video and you've got the file note, you've got the transcript, um, and then you can get on and do these, um, this advisor shaping piece after the meeting at some point, uh, and that's, that's all done for you. So it really is – our focus our trick is very much on how do we make this as easy and simple and unintrusive as possible. And, um, you know, it's, it's an evolution. Uh, we work on it constantly. We have – some great advisors using the platform uh, on a daily basis that are really plug- plugged into what we do and are really enthusiastic about what we do. So we discuss a lot of what we're doing with them. We get ideas from them. And so um, any clients that, that come on to the platform and have an interest in this type of technology and being part of this, we uh, we have a very open and we, we, we really enjoy hearing feedback on what works and what we should be doing next. So, so we, we try and make it as easy as possible. And we will continue giving away at that at every turn and at every opportunity. It's kind of one of our key missions. Perfect. No, thank you for that that insight. And I think I just wanted to quickly ask you around, like you mentioned before, around creating a structured file note. And it's one of the the key bits of functionality that I really love about what you've shown me of FinTalker. You sent me a video prior to this recording. Is you can quite easily create a structured file note, and also I believe you've you've made it so that the AI can pick up the actual topics that are being discussed. Do you mind sort of talking about the approach there? I know you've got um, sort of over 15 different topics that seem to be associated with, you know, financial planning or financial advice. So whether it's, you know, tax planning or super or even like family issues, goals, risk profiles, like do you mind sort of talking about how that has sort of come to be and what the approach has been there? Yeah, sure. So um, so this, this is where having a lens and a focus on financial advice really helps when you're building and developing these tools. So, so there's a few interesting parts to this, this question. So, you, you know, the, the first part is, is actually, it should be simple, but uh, is, is not. The, f- the first thing you want is um, Australian English and not American English. And as <laughs> you would be aware, Patrick, a lot of it, AI... And technology development goes on in the US, so you end up with with US spellings quite a lot. So um, we actually have um, a s- Australian spelling in the system. We also have uh, a system that is trained to understand financial advice terms that are used commonly in Australia. So, so we we've trained on that uh, nomenclature you call it, which is the the kind of vocabulary for financial advice uh, in Australia, and um, we continue to grow that. You know, we continue to um, uh, train the system so that it understands ETFs and aged care and you know, asset allocation and um, all of those things that um, that you want the system to understand. Now, the topic piece and getting structure into the conversation is really interesting because a lot of advisors, and look, it really varies dramatically between advisors. Some advisors are very, very structured around how they set their meetings up and how they go and talk to clients. And, um, you know, they're quick, efficient, to the point. There's a bit of friendly chit-chat and relationship building, of course. There always should be, but they're very structured in how they approach their meetings. So that's one end of the spectrum. Now, the other end of the spectrum, some advisors are not very structured about how they approach their advice conversation. And some advice conversations jump around a lot. There's a lot of um, the conversations go off-piste into, you know, and sometimes for hours. Uh, and 
Um, and so you've got to be able to cope. The system's got to be able to cope with both ends of those spectrums and uh, and everything in between, which is where a lot a lot of people fit. Now, what what we do is is when you're setting up a meeting, you can actually, if you want to, you can select the topics that you want to cover, and you can put them in order. So you can actually, for those advisors on at the end of the spectrum that find it hard to structure a meeting. It actually gets them thinking about well, what am I going to talk about and what order am I yeah, going to talk about? It's an agenda, awesome. and um, and so they can, yeah. So they get an agenda, and then and then um, as the meeting progresses, we tick those off as as we go. Now, we we've done a lot of work to make sure that you you might talk about superannuation at the start of the meeting, in the middle of the meeting, and towards the end of the meeting. You might talk about it three times or more. Or you might talk about it once. But the system needs to be able to recognise that I've switched back to the superannuation topic now, and I'm talking about that. So what this what this allows us to do is uh, is is take this broad range of unstructured data that's in the discussion discussion and begin to bring order to the conversation and structure that up, which allows us to then take all of the information relevant to say superannuation. Put it all together into a into a concise summary of what was said by the client, what was said by the the advisor, and what the what the outcomes and the way forward is, and put that into that section of the file manual. So what you end up with is is fifteen or seventeen, depending on which version you're, you're on, sections of the file note with different sections specific to each part of financial advice conversations. You get a summary at the top that says, you know, here's an overall summary of the meeting, uh, which is a general summary, but it's that detail that you get that allows you in each section. Now, you also get sets of actions out. It's important that the actions are broken into the actions for the advisor and the actions for the client. And you need to know who's, who's saying what in the meeting so FinTalker is able to do this. This, again, gets you the, the efficiency now, at the end of and the productivity game, now at the end of the meeting, not only can the advisor record the shape of the advice, but they can also go through the file note and uh, look through each section. And if you know you didn't talk about superannuation in that particular conversation, then that section will be blank, so there won't be any anything in there. But the sections that are filled in, quick review of it, you can type in and overtype and edit any part of the, the file note. Uh, and it's important to do that. AI is really good and powerful technology, and we we put a lot of time into making it accurate and detailed. But the advisor should always check the file note. It's a bit like, and I use this example sometimes, you know, Tesla has built a self-driving car, right? And they've spent billions of dollars developing algorithms to self-drive a car. But one of their rules is that the driver still has their hands on the steering wheel. And, and I believe in very regulated industries like financial advice that do you, do, you, do you need to have your hands on the steering wheel. And that means that the advisor should always do a quick scan check of the file note and just make sure they're happy with it. And and most are, we have advisors that used to spend an hour and a half writing up their very detailed file notes and now they spend 10 minutes. We're going to get that down to five. In the next couple of releases, you know, we're, we're constantly chipping away at that so, uh, so, so that's that's how it works, and um, uh, how easy it is to use this system. Yeah, no, I love it, and I think that as you're saying there, we just yeah, especially in the current form of AI, we just can't put our sort of blind trust in it, and that everything's going to be okay, and that the file note has been captured perfectly, or any form of sort of AI response, we can't just put our blind trust in it. So, it makes a lot of sense. Now, let's say we've got this big bad file note with a lot of text, albeit now in a very structured way, as you, we sort of talked about there with the different structure or topics. Do you mind sort of touching on the conversational AI functionality that you have and, and sort of what happens next? Like I really believe that asking questions of the transcript is very powerful, especially if you're looking at that file note even a week after or, you know, coming up for review next year, for example. Yes. Yeah, so, look, um, great question. And this is an issue that we've put into FinTalker in the last couple of months. So, um, there are a few generic AI tools that um, allow you to ask questions, but once you get the answer out, you've got to cut and paste them and put them into a Word document. You've got to, you know, it's it's um, yeah, it's still quite cumbersome 
in terms of um, productivity gains, cumbersome for you, some cumbersome in terms of productivity gains. So what you get out of FinTalker is you, you get this very detailed file note out of, out of the box. So as soon as you finish your meeting, you, you can look at it and there it is waiting for you. But there may be an angle on the meeting that you want to explore that's in addition to what's in the file note. For instance, uh, you, know, if you may decide that you want to deep dive into the, the client's desire to sell a holiday house and minimize capital gains tax and um, uh, move the money into their super fund. You know, something quite specific like that. And you remember, you know, and it's listed in the file note that the client talked about it, but you want to deep dive about it in your file note and in, and in the advice preparation. So FinTalker allows you to ask that question of the meeting. So you can ask that question, tell me about the client's, you know, give me a description of the client's desire to sell their house and what are the tax implications. And FinTalker will actually write you a specific answer about that and present that to you. And you can then, with one click, push that into the right section of the file mode. So you don't have to mess around starting from scratch or, or, or copying that into a Word document and reformatting. FinTalker knows um, where to put that for you and with a little bit of guidance from you, you basically say put it into, I don't know, the property section of the file note and boom, that will be appended to the already existing information. So again, this allows you to very quickly, with a couple of clicks, get into any really detailed specifics and pull more detail out about that and um, get that into the file note and into the advice process. So again, it's all about productivity, being able to get, allowing the advisor to get to another level of detail without having to spend half an hour thinking, golly, what did they say? I've got to go back and listen to the audio yeah. or I've got to go back to my, you know, my handwritten notes. No, it's all there for you and you can go back at any time. And I, and I would also say that um, in light of that, we're, we're also, uh, and again, Patrick, you're he- hearing it here first, these are some of the things that are coming. We're actually building the ability to do that across calls as well. So you might, uh, before you go in to see a client, soon have a visual depiction of the timeline of your conversations with that client. Oh, three years ago, the client was getting married. Two years ago, they were buying a house. A year ago, they had a baby. Uh, you know, last time we spoke, they wanted to up their life insurance. Oh, well, at the push of a button, you're going to see a final of that client and be able to absorb that in the moments before you go into the meeting. So instead of if I look through all the old notes, what did I say? What, what were the file notes? What did we write in the SLR? You're going to be able to, at the push of the button for every client, get that almost instantly. So that's all coming as well. Yeah, brilliant. But it's, uh, it's exciting talking about this stuff, Patrick. I'll, yeah, yeah. No, it uh, definitely is exciting. And I think, yeah, gone are the days of Control F. Um, that's just incredible. But also, what you're alluding to there is it, it's actually taking the reliance off a really fully fledged CRM. Because if you're if you're building something like a life events or a milestones timeline. Like that is a core component of knowing your client and, you know, previously that's just stored manually. Like someone will have to, you know, pick that up when they're actually in the meeting that it's a life event or a milestone, make sure they file note it and then manually transpose it wherever those milestones or um, life events are kept. So I think that's really important. And I guess that leads me to my sort of next question is we've got a lot of sensitive data, personal data in the system You've got a background with working with in financial services and especially when there's regulators involved, et cetera. But what's been the approach to security? Like how, how have you solved that? Yeah, so great question, Patrick. And and security is very much at the of everything that we've done since the very beginning. So when we designed FinTalk or we designed it as you would design an enterprise-grade technology system that would run at Macquarie Bank. So- so we've taken those sorts of design steps and those sorts of precautions. So to, to give you an idea, every artifact, and by artifact I mean audio recording, transcript, file note, anything that could have any sort of sensitive information in and and you know you're talking about financial advisor conversations with their clients, 
can you get more sensitive information than those conversations? Um, you know, you, you can argue that the health conversations are more sensitive, uh, possibly uh, from a personal perspective, but not from a financial crime perspective. Yeah, the financial either one would be more more sensitive, I, I believe. So every artifact that is on FinTalker is encrypted using a key that is specific to the advisor. Now, every time an advisor wants to access those records, we go to the Fort Knox and we say, this advisor is asking, and we get the key out, and then the key can be used to unlock and decrypt the data that is in um, uh, in Talker. Now, Elon Musk, uh, who I, I love some things he does and, and, and find other things uh, challenging uh, and, and a bit annoying from Elon, but but one of the things he says is that the ultimate security system is where your own engineers can't read the data. That's the ultimate security system. And that's how we've been built, FinTalker. Our own engineers are not able to access any of those artifacts that contain sensitive information about clients. We need the permission of the advisor in order to access that data. So from a security perspective, our own people are unable to read the data, let alone anyone else. So that, that immediately puts you in an incredibly secure position. I also want to talk about data sovereignty, and I, and I just can't emphasize how important this is. So a lot of tech companies, a lot of general biz tech companies, and a lot of AI companies are hosted in the US, um, and and a lot of commonly used bits to text transcription engines, the data is all in the US. And, and further, a lot of the financial advisor advisors in Australia that use data technologies know that the data is in Australia. So think about it. We, we, we have, there are some people out there who are taking the most sensitive financial data that belongs to a client, and they are moving it offshore to the US into a low-jurisdiction data protection country. Now, where it goes from there, who knows? Is it, is it being serviced in India or are people, you know, is this, uh, who knows? So when you're handling this type of incredibly sensitive data, it needs to be kept in Australia. It cannot be pushed internationally. There was a, uh, a case recently where the German government, the German military, was actually hacked by the Russian Secret Service using, uh, whilst they were using a US-hosted um, meeting service, so I kid you not, the Russian Secret Service managed to tap call, steal all of the data, and they were talking about what sort of missiles they were going to supply to the Ukraine and whether they could be used and targeted against Russian territory. So, of course, you can imagine how sensitive that data was, and that was because the US military was using it. So a big, big gap on their part. But this is this, these are the sorts of things that can happen when you send your data offshore. You know, if the German government's getting it wrong, you know, what chance is a small <laughs> they got uh, using a speech to text service? Um, and and I think what's you know, if you look at what's happening in cyber in Australia, we had, we had the Optus issues, uh, we had the Medibank issues. This is only getting bigger. The rules, the laws, and the and the fines are getting quite massive now, and um, and, and really business changing if you fall foul of them. So in my view. Uh, sending your client sensitive data offshore is, is, I just can't see how you've got any sort of defendable position. So keeping your data onshore is key. So all of our data is onshore in Australia. It's all protected and encrypted. We uh, have all sorts of um, intruder protection, scan protection, and that's at the heart of what we do. That comes first. Um, and so, uh, you know, as, as a lot of small AI startups happen, and um, come to market. Often they're looking to leverage this technology in the fastest possible way. And but, but where you need to be in this type of industry is security has got to come first. And we've been building FinTalker for uh, more than three years and, and building and using enterprise design patterns that are common in, in big finance and places like Macquarie. So, yeah, I can't overemphasize that. I know I've talked a lot about that, Patrick, but security is really important. 
No, I, I really, I really love your response there, and it, it feels like you've answered like every possible licensee question, or you have an answer to every possible licensee question in how you've built this in terms of functionality and approach. So, I think that's yeah, that's really compelling. Um, I mean, we're just talking about security and and keeping your data secure, et cetera, and sovereignty. Integration, what's the approach been there, James, in terms of integrating with other tools? Um, I assume advisors want to export that phone out once they're happy with it. Like how does that sort of work in the platform? Yeah, well, um, in integration and as we talked about earlier, getting this seamless transfer of data yeah. and getting that process really working seamlessly is, is you know, integration is a part of that. And so... We're constantly working on um, building out our integrations. We have a very strong API, so the APIs are the, the interface protocols. We have a very strong interface uh, design pattern, and um, we see building out these interfaces as, as key to getting these productivity gains. So we're currently working with Xplan to get the interface built into Xplan. We are interfacing uh, into some of the key client portals that are used in the industry. Uh, we're into interfacing into some of the key advice generation tools. And uh, and and it's a major part of our roadmap. I would say that we're, you know, as as always, we're kind of client driven on this. So so the more clients that say they want a particular interface, that will come up our priority curve and we'll build that out. But we we see a world in the future where the advisor attends the meeting, pushes few buttons as possible and the meeting is captured. Everything as far as it's technically possible is done for them and the data is, with, with their permission when they're happy with it, the data is pushed to all of those systems that they have to interface to um, and work in downstream. You know, the last thing you want is um, an advisor having to retype things. Uh, you know, that's a disaster from a productivity perspective. So everything's got to be seamless. For advisors that are just getting started with this, so you know, let's say an advisor comes onto FinTalker and and you know they they use um, uh, a smaller CRM system that we're not yet interfaced to, or they use something bespoke, or so within the system you're able to export um, into PDF, export into Word, and so a lot of advisors when they first get started, you know, they want to start simple, so. Once they're happy with the file note, they just push a button and, and that will download the file note and the, sorry, the other documents and compliance checks and and that's um and then they're able to upload that into SharePoint or whatever else they're using um or or whatever CRM system they're using. So we've we've built out of the box ways that with a with a single click you can download and move these files and get this information in and out. You can also, if you want to, you can get the audio out. You can get the video out, uh, and so um, uh, and so this allows you to store those artifacts externally and use them externally if if that's what you want. So that's how we've approached interfacing. You can start small and um, you know, and then and then the other end of the spectrum, you have some of the big licensing. So you know, uh, some of some of the bigger licensees are are on FinTalker, and you know they have, and we have more coming on all the time. Their yeah. ambition is to have FinTalker very seamlessly integrated into their system. So they might want single sign-on. So, you know, once you've signed on to the licensee's technology, it automatically signs you on to FinTalker. Yeah, integration into their own systems. So so that we that we work on as well for the bigger licensees and um, you know, that's quite exciting for us as well. We you know, we we love it when these systems just everything just works and the advisor just has you know, our dream is the advisor can walk from one meeting to the next and everything is just done for them. Uh, that's, that's where we want to get to. Yeah, perfect. And that obviously flows down into everyone that's supporting them as well and making their life easier, which is where we all need to get to. I guess looking forward and, and longer term, do you feel that this is a great tool for uh, maybe newer advisors or, or younger advisors coming into the profession? Because my understanding is that you can, because we're categorizing everything into topics, uh, or scopes of advice, you could essentially create a library where all the common topics or all the common um, discussion points that are considered come up in conversation and keep advisors on track. Do you have any comments there around where it's heading sort of longer term? Yeah, very much. And look, uh, great question. And this this um, 
is is really central to our vision for the future. And yeah, if you look at financial advice in Australia, what the country needs is more younger people coming into advice and becoming advisors. Uh, but they're inexperienced and they're going to take a while to come up. You know, for a licensee, you know, having a, a, a for a practice, having a whole set of younger advisors is 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 a good for medium to long term business, but also uh, brings risk into your business, right? Because you've got younger, less experienced people talking directly with clients, and at some point you need them to be doing that in an unsupervised way uh, in order to get the, the business benefit out of that. So, Big Talker is able to help guide those young advisors uh, in meeting if required. It can do it after meeting, but in meeting. I talked earlier in the podcast about being able to bring this data in and do things with it real time versus after the meeting. And this is one of the use cases that talks very much to the benefit of, of having a platform that can uh, work with a lot of voice data in real time. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of, uh, of how this can work. FinTalker understands um, a lot of the key compliance and requirement disclaimers that are, that are required in particular types of meetings. So I'll give you a, an example. Um, if it's a general advice meeting, uh, which you know you may get a lot of your junior advisors to give, well, FinTalker understands the general advice disclaimer. It understands, and it understands in a qualitative way. So the quality of the disclaimer that's issued. So if I said, "Oh, Patrick, uh, this is general," FinTalker would uh, would know that you're trying to give a general advice disclaimer, but you've given quite a poor one. So it would actually say, "Oh, you've attempted that, uh, but you know we're going to give you quite a low score on that." And here's what you should say if you really want to give a, you know, if you really want to knock it out of the park with a general advice disclaimer, then, you know, here's what you should say. Patrick, this is this advice is general in nature. It doesn't pertain to your personal circumstances. You should check this advice against your own financial situation and position and, and make your own decision. Oh, well, you know, that sort of general advice disclaimer gets a, gets a big tick. Um, so what that allows you to do is it allows you to have more junior advisors operating in a much safer environment and and with the system giving them a guidance as they go, either in meeting if, if you want that, and especially if it's a, a Teams meeting, that's, that's very easy to do and very easy for the junior advisor to be watching those things as it mm-hmm. happens. Um, but also post-meeting. So after the meeting, um, they, they get a score. You know, here's the things you did and here's the things you missed. Actually, when you get to the end of the meeting, and you go to end of the meeting, the system will actually say to you, hey, you know, we, we, you should have been doing five or six things here. You only did three of those. Are, are you sure you're happy with that? And the answer might be, yes, I'm happy with that because I did the other stuff offline or I'm happy with that because I'm going to do that on an email. But but it prompts you um, uh, at the end of the meeting. So you can carry on the meeting and say to the client, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you X, Y, and Z, and that will tick off another one for you. So the, the vision here is that not only can you help junior advisors and, and younger people developing, and you, know, you can do that, and you can allow them to help them give safer advice. You can help give the practice and the licensing some more confidence that they're operating in a safer way and they're able to ramp up their workforce without uh, dramatically ramping up the risk. Uh, and also what we're trying to do is help help with compliance at source rather than you compare that today, what happens? Well, the advisor might meet, they, they copy a template with their file note and they copy in a few details and they copy all, everything they might have done in the last 10 meetings and, and they file that away and six months later, compliance might come and may come and look at that depending on whether it's randomly sampled and they pick it up. They may look at it and they may say, oh, okay, the, the, you know, there's something wrong here. But what you've got is then this 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 trail of six months of potential non-compliance buried in the advice book, which is high risk. Whereas what we're trying to do is right up front, the advice is happening, help coach the more junior advisors, help guide them, help them tick these things off uh, and and take a lot of that risk out of the book. So it's a really important part of FinTalker and a really key piece of why we wanted to build a real-time system versus a system that, quite frankly, would have been much easier to build, which would be 
for the fact at some point later in the day or tomorrow or at the end of the week processes these um, conversations and um, uh, and does everything retrospectively. The in meeting capability and the real time capability really opens up a huge avenue of helping with this this compliance aspect. Yeah, there's a real a real reg tech component to this and I think it's you've made something where or you're on the way to building something that totally basically everyone wins so whether that's a client the advisor their team or the licensee like it, I can't it's just, yeah, it's just incredibly compelling so yeah thank you James and what's the best way for someone to learn more about FinTalker well the best way is to go to our website which is um, www.fintalker.com so that's f-i-n-t-a-l-k-r.com there's a um, video that you can watch there. There's a whole lot of information about how it works. Uh, you can also um, sign up for a trial. So we have a two-week trial period so people can try the technology out. And actually, we love people to sign up, try it out. We love to hear people's feedback, people's comments. This is a, um, a journey, and um, we're looking, and we want to build the, the most fantastic tool for financial advisors in Australia that you can imagine. And um, so we we love it when people sign up. We love it when people give us feedback. We, we love hearing how we can make it even better. So um, so go to our website, have a look at it, uh, contact us at um, support at uh, fintalker.com or info at fintalker.com. And, um, yeah, engagement is um, fantastic, so we'd love to hear about it. Perfect. Um, James, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed the discussion. Congratulations on a, on a brilliant product, and thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. It's been great to be here, and I uh, really enjoyed the discussion. Mm-hmm.